Good morning, Streams Church. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, for your presence this morning. Thank you for mercies that are new every day. Thank you, Father. We align ourselves with you today, body, soul, spirit. We say, have your way, Holy Spirit. Have your way, Jesus. Thank you, Father. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. Sacrifice. 
through this act that he gave us. John 6, Jesus was preaching. He said, unless you eat of my body and drink of my blood, you have no life. The life of God, the power of redemption and these elements. If you will come on up and grab elements, we'll take them back to our seats and partake together as we continue to worship. talked a few weeks ago about communion and the remembrance of the covenant, the covenant that he made with us and the covenants that we've made with him, the divine exchange. Just bring to your your memory the vows and the promises that you've made to the Lord. Bring to your memory the things that he has done for you. It says that we understand and discern the body of the Lord, which is the elements, but also the communion, the community that he's put us within. Search your hearts and see if there's any place where your hearts are not at peace with another person made in the image of God. Jesus said, if you come to bring your offering and you realize that your brother is something against you, go and reconcile first and then present your offering. Search your heart and see if there's something that you need to do to make that right or if there's just forgiveness to be released. See if there's anything in your heart rebellion against the Lord. Any act of sin that you're currently in that you need to repent of. Jesus, we thank you for breaking the bread of your body, for pouring out the wine of your blood. We thank you for the covenant that we've been drawn into. We thank you that there is redemption, that there's power in your broken body for healing, for freedom from all of the effects of sin. We thank you that there's power in your blood to cleanse and to forgive to release the very life of God in our hearts, in our souls, and in our bodies. And so, Lord, we remember your sacrifice. The body of the Lord has been broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of him. the new covenant that was poured out for you. Take and drink in remembrance of him. Lord, give us thankful hearts for what you've done.
You're so kind to welcome us in. You're so gracious. You're so merciful to us, Abba. We don't deserve your mercy, yet you give it so freely. So freely. So kindly. With open arms. You're calling us continually, reaching out for us. Thank you, Abba. Thank you, Abba. We thank you that you are enough. That you are enough. That your blood is enough. We thank you. We thank you for the the scars that you wear for us, Lord. We thank you for the scars in your hands and in your feet, Jesus. We thank you for the price that you paid for us. We thank you, Abba, for giving your son so we could come in. We love you. We love you. We love you, Lord. We thank you, God. So good. Oh my goodness. Welcome, welcome, Streams Church. So glad to see y'all's beautiful faces. Welcome online. I know we may have some first time guests. If we do, we have a little form on the table out. We'd love to get your information and reach out to you. And we won't knock on your front door, but just want an opportunity to get to know you. There's also a place for prayer requests and We definitely want to know how to be praying for y'all, so please, please let us know. And on that, I just thank you guys for who got on Wednesday night. I know the ice storm was a little crazy, so we were, I know I feel so blessed to be able to be hunkered down at home in the ice storm, so, but Zoom is a great technology, and so we were able to pray online, and it was beautiful. So thank y'all who got on, and and just as we continue in this place, I want to give you opportunity to bring your tithes and offerings. And I just, on the way here this morning, I was thinking about God's faithfulness and the tithe. And John and I just celebrated 26 years of marriage. And we've, we've never not tithed. It's just something we've always done. And I would be lying if I said there wasn't times that I'm like, are you serious? We have to tithe? And we have to tithe on that? Everything we get? Like, really? Isn't that a gift for, for us? You know, all the things. I mean, it's, it's been a... But we... Thank you, John. <laughs> We've done it. And he's taken care of us. And we are just in awe of how gracious and kind he has been to us and generous he's been to us. And I mean, the scripture says it, right? It's something we could test him in that he's faithful. If we bring the tithe into the storehouse, he's going to open up the floodgates of heaven and bless us. So if you're not a tither, you should be. I welcome you to do it. So Father, we thank you that everything we have is a gift from you. And we ask, Father, that you would pour down blessings. Lord, I ask that you pour down on every giver on every gift, Lord, that you would use it for your kingdom expansion, for your glory, Lord, use it for your purposes, in Jesus' name. I didn't go through all the things, but y'all know how to give. There's Now there's five ways, because you can scan the thing in front of you, you can give online, you can give on our app, envelope in the back, so we welcome you to do that. Um, okay, Ledbetter's group meets this week. Other thing, I'm just I'm just thinking of things this morning. This morning I realized I was doing announcements, so I'm like, ooh, what am I supposed to say? I just, small groups, I just can't say enough. Again, thinking about how we just celebrated 26 years of marriage. John and I got married in a little room in our church, like 
it, we went to a pretty large church at the time, but we got married off to the side in a little room, like room C or something, you know. And my dad drew flowers on the whiteboard. I mean, I'm not kidding. That's how small our wedding was. We went out to Mexican food after, and everybody bought their own, and we went and stayed at a Motel 6. So that was our, our wedding. It was, you know, just our parents and siblings and my grandparents. And Anyway, thinking about small groups, I just... You know, I get up here and I cry and I mess up my eyelashes and I'm just a hot mess. I should know by now to bring a Kleenex, but just overwhelmed at the importance of small groups this morning, thinking about it. Like our small group and our the Vineyard Church that we were a part of was our family. I mean, they were so incredible, so incredible. They threw us a surprise wedding shower because we'd had no, I mean, it was, like I said, very small. We Surprise, we, get, we got our first dishes. I still have some of the dishes from then. and our so, I mean, they threw us a surprise wedding shower, and we got baptized together. And small groups are just amazing. So I can't say enough about small groups if you're not a part of one. Right now we just have one outside of the Wednesday night group that's meeting here. But the Leadbetters are meeting in the colony this Thursday. And if you need information, just please see them. They're amazing. We are going to have more small groups coming this later this year. They're just not here yet, but I encourage you to go to small group. Okay, next thing is crowned with beauty. For you ladies who were here when we had this conference before, y'all know the gift that Charity is and amazing stuff. So we are excited to hear back from her. She got to go away this weekend at a little retreat for women in ministry, and we know there's going to be good things. I received a group text about how God did some really cool things, and so we're going to be recipients of that. And if you would like to go, Kerrville is only about six hours away. She's doing Crown with Beauty again up there at a wonderful church, Cross Kingdom Church. So, but please be praying for her. This is a really important conference. There's a lot of women up there who need this, and it's just really important. So please be praying for that. And then last is the gathering we want to invite you to. So that is coming up in Feb February 18th. Thank you, honey. I decided not to bring notes today. I expected the date to be on there. Anyway, love you guys. <laughs> she is amazing. She really is. Wow, wow, wow. Man, worship was beautiful. It's funny, I knew I was going to be doing communion, but I could not settle on whether I was supposed to do it before I spoke or after I spoke. I just had no idea. I didn't know they were going to be singing that song. They started singing that song. I'm like, well, we now have communion. Let's, let's do this right now. This is, this is perfect. It works. Wow. Let me pray. Daddy, you are so amazing. All that you do, Lord, this life that you've given us, this possibility of friendship with you, being drawn into the great adventure of seeing your kingdom come and being a part of it, touching lives and touching families and touching communities and touching nations. God, you are amazing. Lord, your, your plans are good. What you have determined should be accomplished is, is the most beautiful thing that could be. And Lord, that you, you give us the ability to be a part of your plans and purposes being fulfilled in the earth. What an honor. What, what a holy privilege. Lord, we want to be faithful to what you've invited us to. We want to be faithful to this call to, to represent you, 
to walk with you, to be in your presence and to release your presence and to be a, a kingdom of priests. So astounding. Lord, I'm asking for grace to be poured out that even as I speak, Lord, that you would use the words that are spoken to carry truth, to carry spirit, to carry life. Lord, that you would cause words to transform lives, Lord. You use the, the weakness of our speaking to change. That's what I'm asking, Lord. Would you anoint words with your Holy Spirit and cause faith to arise in hearts, cause understanding to be released into minds, and cause submission to your plans and purposes to be released into wills that Jesus would be glorified. Yeah. Jesus, we bow before your authority. You are king. You rule. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come and do what you love to do. Release manifestations of the Spirit to cause Jesus to be recognized as good and beautiful. So we declare that this time, this space, this gathering, this message is holy unto you for your purposes and your purposes alone. You are worthy. Hmm. Well, I want to talk a little bit today about intercession. I had my glasses on my shirt and I kept on touching my heart, which means I was touching my glasses and it's kind of hard to see out of them, so I got to clean them real quick then I can actually read my notes. Um, actually, I called this intercession is for everyone. When you, when you think of the idea of an intercessor, what, what pictures come to mind? Depending on where you've been, the, the, the groups that you've been around, you, you can have all kinds of different pictures that, that might come to mind. Sometimes it's a you know, small group that gets together in a, in a little room um, a friend of mine that is uh, that is a widow, and uh, she she jokes about how everybody thinks of her as as uh, since she's the ol the older woman that she's she's the intercessor in her little group. Um, you know, sometimes we we think maybe an older person that has some extra time they they could be an intercessor. Maybe maybe if you've been in a different circle, a uh, intercessor is somebody that gets really loud and yells at spiritual entities. <laughs> maybe in different circles, maybe you think of Lou Engle, who is calling for fast and knowing the difference between the Esther fast. I, I can't really do Lou Engle, but man, I love that man. He, is, he changed my life. Somebody actually knows the difference between an Esther fast and a Daniel fast and a Jesus fast and, and why you would do each one of those and when. Um, maybe you think of somebody that, that sits around and, and cries out in repentance and tears falling down. Maybe you think of somebody that you're not quite sure if they're spiritual or if they're depressed because they're somber and they're burdened with all the bad things that are going on in the world and they can't stop thinking about all the stuff that needs to be fixed. Yeah, the reality is that any of these could be pictures of what an intercessor might or might not be, but none of them are the picture of what an intercessor is. 
So the question is, what, what is an intercessor? Well, the, the word to intercede literally means to pray for somebody else or for something else other than yourself. So how many of you have ever asked God to do something that was not for you specifically? All right, so now you can look around and see intercessors. <laughs> That's intercession. That, that is intercession, is when you're praying for someone else, when you're praying about something that, that is not directly related to you, praying for your child, praying for your parents, praying for your spouse, praying for your city, praying for your business, praying for your boss, hopefully praying for them, not against them. The, this is intercession. It literally means to go between two things. One of the words for intercession in the Hebrew means to, to pick up and to carry something for a period of time. In the dictionary, it says that an intercessor is to intervene on behalf of another. So, thinking about biblically, who fits the picture of an intercessor? Now, if we go with the common picture of intercessor, we have one good example that kind of fits a common picture, Anna in the temple, right? She'd been praying for 85 years, spending all of her time fasting and praying uh, as an intercessor. But if you start looking through at the people who interceded, a lot of them don't fit the normal picture. The first real picture of an intercessor that we have is Abraham. Yeah, Abraham is um, hanging out, out one day and he sees these three people walking by and doing what anybody at that time would have done that was honorable. He offers them hospitality. Hey, come in, let me get you some food. Let me get you something to drink. Let me wash your feet. And in exchange for that, tell me the news because I want to know what's going on because I can't look on Facebook or on the news app. And so that, that would be the, the normal thing. So he invites them in and finds out it's actually God and a couple angels. And he goes for a walk after they're done eating and God sends the angels ahead and him and God start having this conversation. Should I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? You know, I come down to, to look at Sodom and Gomorrah because of what I've been hearing. Let me tell him. And so he tells Abraham and Abraham's response is, wait a second, my, my nephew lives in Sodom. This is not good. But God, you're the judge of the all, all the earth. Like if there's 50 that are righteous, like you, you wouldn't destroy the whole town if there's 50, would you? No, no, I, I wouldn't do that. And he just keeps on going, gets down to 10. Right? He, he's asking for someone else. That, that's a picture of intercessor. A, a few chapters later when he is, you know, because of famine, he'd gone to the, the area of Abimelech, which one of the king's, that was in the area. And his wife had been taken into the harem because he was saying that she was his sister. God shows up in a dream to Abimelech and says, hey, um, give the man back his wife. Well, I didn't know she was his wife. Well, I know, but that's why I'm telling you. Give the man back his wife because this man is a prophet. And by the way, he will pray for you. Now, this, this is something that's important because there, there's a principle in scriptural study we call the law of first mention. It's this concept that when you want to understand a topic, that you look at the first time that it's mentioned, and that sets a precedence that you see every other time it's mentioned through. So we have two precedences right now in Abraham, the, you know, one of them, intercession, asking God, pleading with God for his mercy in a situation, bringing about a change to the stated plans of God. Now, that would help a whole bunch of prophetic ministry if we'd realize that our role is to help bring about a change to his stated plans, not just say how good those were. But that is a principle that shows up a few times in Abraham. You see it in Moses. You see it in throughout the prophets that this is a part. But the other part is that the role of someone that talks to God, a prophetic person, the primary role is prayer. The man is a prophet and he will pray for you. It didn't say the man's a prophet and he's gonna give you a word. 
Didn't say the man's a prophet and he's going to tell you what's going to happen. Said the man is a prophet, he's going to pray for you. That, that there's this role, and it doesn't mean you have to be a prophet to be a prayer, but the primary role of someone that is prophetic is prayer and intercession, not proclamation. That is a secondary role. And that is an important thing. So you have this picture of Abraham. Now, thinking about Abraham's role, Abraham was a nomadic shepherd, meaning he traveled around and took care of animals. Right, that, that was his job. He wasn't what most of us would think of, like his role, his job was not prophet. His job was not all these other things. His job was to take care of animals and take care of his family. But as he did that, he prayed and he interceded. Another picture, Moses. Moses, again, I mean, he, he's, he's another shepherd that gets called out of being a shepherd and ends up leading a nation. So he's, he's a governmental leader and he is a shepherd. And he, he's a picture that we have of intercession. Again, he's, he's going, talking to God about the people, talking to people about God, going between to bring about the purposes of God into the earth. Picture of an intercessor. Samuel. Now Samuel actually was called a, a prophet, the prophet Samuel. That, that was his major role. A lot of people don't realize until you look into this, the story. He was also the priest that was offering sacrifices. So he was of the tribe of Levi. And he also led the nation. He, he was the judge. So he, he was the guy that everybody would come to, to to deal with the issues. Like if something was right or wasn't right, what do we do in this situation? Hey, we want a king. How do we get a king? He was the person that they came to as the leader of the nation. So again, not what we often think of as an intercessor. How about David? David is a king. Right? He's got a high level of authority. He's got a bunch of things that he's responsible. You realize how none of these fit this picture of somebody that has extra time. <laughs> that is not what an intercessor is. Somebody that has something that they're responsible for. So David is responsible for a nation. He's responsible for a calling. And so because of that, he intercedes. Daniel was also a prophet. We know him as a prophet. In his day, he wasn't really known as a prophet. He was known as an administrator. He, he was a, another governmental leader. He was in top three, the three guys that ran the whole empire. Can you imagine the amount of work that that takes without email, without phones, and without faxes? <laughs> Where you, every meeting is actually a face-to-face -face meeting. Writing by hand, sending things off, communicating, navigating, dealing with all of this, and in the midst of it, making sure that he was doing that through a life of prayer. Ezra was a priest, a scribe, and a teacher that was also an intercessor. Nehemiah is a guy that would drink wine before the king did so that he would die first in case it was poisoned. But because he was trusted, he ended up being governor as well, rebuilding the wall, reestablishing order in, 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 in Judah. And, and this, this he, he was an intercessor. He, he hears about the wall being broken down. And the first thing that he does is he begins to grieve and fast while he's working. And he waits until he feels the okay of the Lord before he lets his boss realize that he's praying and fasting and grieving. But when he feels the okay, he actually lets his face be sad, which opens up a door for a conversation. Now, the ultimate picture of an intercessor is Jesus. I mean, he was the savior of the world. He had a lot of stuff to do. There, there was a lot of responsibility on his plate, which was why he prayed. 
which was why he prayed. See, it's a, it's a switch from some of this mindset that we've been given. Paul was a tent maker that taught, preached, and planted churches, traveled a lot. And he talks about the constant burden of the churches that, that he was constantly carrying. He, he was praying for them. Almost every one of his letters, he, he tells them how he's praying for them. He was constantly in prayer interceding because his role as a leader was so important. Not, not the picture of somebody that is so important that they need other people to pray for them because they can't. His primary role was this place of prayer. Now, here, here's our common thread. They all had responsibilities, which is why they prayed. Anybody responsible for something? You have families, jobs, things, things that you've said you're going to do, commitments. All of those responsibilities, the only way to actually accomplish them the right way is to bathe the responsibility in prayer. God has given us this access. In Ephesians, it says that through him, through Christ, we have access to the Father. We, we've been given access. He, Hebrews says that because our high priest has gone in, we can also go in, and because he understands us, we can have confidence that we can go before the throne and ask when we want. That, that's for all believers. We, we've been given access to be able to talk to him about the things that we're responsible for and that's the way that we accomplish them prayer is actually the way that we use our spiritual authority it's not the last resort that we run to when nothing else works and one of the, the great works of discipleship in, in reshifting the way that we think is we tend to exhaust all of our own ideas and then we start looking for others. We, 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 think, we do what we think that we should do. We, we do what we thought maybe would work and what we came up with later and then we ask somebody else when none of that worked. And then if that doesn't work, then we, well, I mean, all else fails, I guess we can pray. But we're reshifting to where our first thought is, oh, I think I know what I should do. God, what do you think? Instead of just doing. Now, there's a mindset that we have to deal with because it's not coming out of this poverty idea that I better not mess it up or else God's not going to like me so I need to check in with him so he can tell me what to do. But out of I don't have enough power, I actually need his power and I'm gonna do the best that I can do but because I'm pleasing to my father, I know that he wants to be with me so I want to invite him in. You ever have somebody that just... You know, you, you, you maybe you, you leave church today and you get into your car and somebody you don't know very well hops into your passenger seat and you hadn't had a conversation with them. W would that be weird? <laughs> Wouldn't it be normal for them to ask, hey, can, do you mind if I go to lunch with you guys? Do you mind if I ride along with you? It is, it's appropriate to ask permission before you presume, which is the principle of prayer. It's not because he, he doesn't understand. It's not because he doesn't desire to, but he's waiting for us to ask him before he steps in and joins us with what we're doing. I mean, Jesus is teaching about prayer and he, he goes, hey, dad already knows everything that you want, so ask him for it. He already knows everything, that's why you ask. It's also why you don't just keep on trying to ask, trying to convince him because your many words are gonna wear him out and he's actually gonna finally do what you want because you didn't let it go. That's not the right mentality. You don't have to do that. It's just that trust, that expectation 
that if you ask, he's going to help take care of the things that you have. But he's waiting for an invitation. Psalm chapter 115, verse 16, gives us a, a core principle that this is based off of. Psalm 115, verse 16 says, the heavens are the Lord's heavens, but the earth he has given to the children of man. The earth he has given to the children of man. Now, some important things. God actually honors his own choices. Which means that when he gives you something, he's actually given it to you, which means that you can destroy it, you can misuse it. It's yours. So he's not just going to jump in every time when something's not going the right way. Sometimes he does out of his mercy. But the norm is that he's waiting for you. He, he's given you authority and so you get to use that authority. Now the thing is, it, you, you, the authority that you have, the things that you have authority over are beyond your ability, which means you're gonna need to ask, which is his whole point in doing it in the first place because he's not interested in getting things accomplished. It would be easier for him to do it himself if that was his interest. He's interested in spending time with you. And so he's given you something that you're gonna need him to help you with so that you will actually spend time with him. Because his desire from the very beginning has been time, relationship. He, he doesn't need anything, but he wants you. And then that, that beautiful understanding is key. So when he gives you something, you have the authority to deal with it. The earth he's given to the sons of men. He's going to periodically step in because he needs to but he stepped in as a man because it was man's responsibility to steward the earth. It's part of the, the why he became fully God and fully man. I mean, it, it wasn't just to identify with us so that he could take on our sin. That, that was key, but it wasn't the only piece. The other piece is he'd given the authority over the earth to man, so man had to get the authority back. He could have just wiped it all out and started over. But he had given the earth to the sons of men. And so he left it in the hands of sons of men, even though they turned it over to the devil. And now he's working with us, in us, and he will eventually come back as a man and stand on the earth and he will rule and everything will bow. But until that time, he's letting us rule and reign with him, which is the point of intercession. So we have talents, we have abilities, we have relationships, we have time, we have resources, and we've been given these things so that we can accomplish his purposes. Not, not because he needs his purposes, purposes to be accomplished, but because we need his purposes to be accomplished. Because in his purposes being accomplished, then we find fulfillment, we find security, we find the good that we're all longing for, it's found in him. And so he's given us these things so that we can come into the fullness of what was intended for us as people, but that's where prayer comes in. We have to ask. It's a stewardship. So ultimately, he owns it all but he's put it into our hands. But at one day, we're gonna give an account for what we did with everything in our hands. What we did with our resources, what we did with our time, what we did with our gifts, our abilities, what we did with our opportunities, that, that we're gonna have to give an account for that, which is why intercession is so important. When God gives us an assignment we need to pray about that assignment. It's part of our responsibility. Samuel understood this. Samuel 
It's in 1 Samuel 13, 23, but I'll tell you the, the story. So Samuel comes to the end of his ministry and he's giving his retirement speech, basically. He says, hey guys, I, I did the best that I could. Anybody have anything against me? Did, did I wrong anybody? Have I been unjust? Have I, you know, have I taken a bride and bribe and not done what, what was intended? Have I you know, taken anything from somebody I didn't deserve? Nobody had anything against him. And, and, and the people are like, but hey, you know, don't leave. I know you've given us a king, but don't leave us alone. Like, you know, we, we still really appreciate you. He goes, no, 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 don't worry about it. He goes, I will not sin against the Lord by stopping to pray for you. See, he, he recognized he'd been given an assignment to help this people. What had been put into his hand, and it would actually be a sin against the Lord for him not to pray for what God had given him to steward. That principle is key to our lives. It's one of the principles that Samuel clearly communicated to David because you, you look at David's life and you find this phrase popping up again and again and again. And David inquired of the Lord. And David inquired of the Lord. Like he could have figured, I mean, he was a brilliant military commander. He could have figured out how to go into battle with the Philistines. But instead of trying to figure it out and getting the best information that he could get and coming up with a plan, he inquires of the Lord. He, he didn't presume. Actually, one, one of his prayers, it's one of, my, one of my favorite prayers that stuck with me out of the Psalms. Lord, keep me, protect me from the sin of presumption that I would presume and not rely on your voice. I don't want to presume anything. I, I want to trust you. I want to have my full heart looking to you. When we ask him, it actually pleases him. When, when we've been given something, responsibility, and we ask God, Lord, I need wisdom. How do I do this? How do I handle this? How do I, how, how do I navigate this the right way? It, it actually pleases the Lord's heart for us to ask. Remember Solomon? Solomon, he, he started out really good, right? He, he comes into the kingship, and, and his first thing is worship. Let's worship. And he, you know, he, he goes to the altar that Moses had built because the, the temple had not yet been built. He, he goes to the altar and he begins to sacrifice. And that night, while he's still there at Gibeah where, where the altar is and he's sleeping, the Lord comes to him in a dream and said, okay, you got my attention. What do you want? I'll give you anything. Uh, how, how many of us would like to have that one? God show up and say, you can ask anything you want. I'm gonna give it to you. Notice Solomon's response. It's good, good wisdom. Lord, give me a listening heart so that I can discern wisdom. That, that, that was his prayer. I, I want a heart that listens to you so that I can recognize what's wise. You, you've given me this responsibility. There's no way I can do what you've asked me to do. I need you to speak to me. I, I need your help in doing this. So teach my heart how to listen to you so that I can recognize the right and the wrong and do the right thing in the moment. And God said, that, that's what you're asking for? You, yeah, of course. Like that's, wow. I like that. I'm going to give you that. I'm going to give you some other stuff too, just because that was really cool. But his response, it said it pleased the Lord that this was his response, that he would ask for wisdom, a listening heart to discern when he, he's given the opportunity because God had put something into his hand and it was going to take God to navigate it. We need to bring him in. James 1.5 says that God gives wisdom to anyone who asks. He, he, he doesn't do it because he's feeling bad, like, well, I mean, you should have figured it out. I gave you the Bible. You could have just read it. It says he gives liberally without reproach. 
Like, I, 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 need, I need wisdom right now. He says, well, like, I already gave you what you need. You should have been able to figure it out. It's not, not at all. He's like, yes. His heart is pleased with that request that we would ask. Prayer for others invites God into those situations. And here's the thing. The busier that we get and the more responsibilities that we have, the greater the prayer life needs to be to be able to handle the responsibilities. Whenever you get to the point where you're too busy to pray, you've taken on more than what God wants you to do. Whenever you get to the point when you are too busy to pray, you have taken on more than what God wants you to do. It's an easy discernment process. I don't have time to be with you. I'm doing stuff for you. No. It will always fail. You can have all the right intentions you can have all the book knowledge, you can have all the giftings and the abilities, it's going to fall apart because without him, you can do nothing. Abide in me, John 15, and I will abide in you because without me, you, you can't do anything. I, I, I chose you. You, you didn't choose me. I, I chose you. I appointed you. I put you where you're at. And the reason I put you there is so that you would bear fruit, eternal fruit that's going to remain. And the way you're going to do that is because you're going to ask the Father and he's going to give to you because you asked, because he gets glory when what you do accomplishes eternal fruit. Now, if you do something outside of him, it may accomplish fruit, but it will not be eternal fruit. It will be fading fruit. We'll find out at the end of our days that it was wood, hay, and stubble that gets consumed. But when it's done in relationship and out of this constant interaction with him, relying on his strength, we find out that the things that we're doing are actually gold and silver and precious metal. And it, it makes it through the fire of testing that all of creation will go through on that final day. I'm not going to follow that rabbit. I really wanted to. It'll take too long to explain it. So we need to ask. We need to ask him to come in. James chapter 4 verse 2 tells you do not have because you do not ask. And when we're not asking and we're not in that relationship with him, what we end up doing is we end up fighting and abusing other people. We end up blaming them and thinking that they're a fool, which is murdering them. You fight, you war over your own passions. You do not have because you do not ask. And, and when you do ask, you're asking out of the wrong motives. Like, what's the right motive? God, you've given me something beautiful to do. And I want to do it with you. How do I do this for your glory? Wrong motive. God, I need this. I. I don't trust you. I trust myself. I've already figured out what was good. Now give me what I think I need. Wrong motive. God, I know what I want, but what I want even more than that is I want your glory. I, I want to follow your purposes. I want to accomplish your plans. How do I do that? Lord, this situation, I, 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 need you to, I need you to move in this situation. So what do we intercede for? Well, what's God's will in whatever sphere we're involved in? Well, I'm not sure. Well, that's a great way to intercede. God, what's your will? The thing with asking God questions like this, we've been given some pictures that are not always true. Sometimes when you ask God, tell me your will, he tells you exactly what it is. And sometimes he doesn't. 
He just causes you to meet certain people and doors to open and things to happen that you end up finding yourself on God's will later. Remember Abraham? Follow me. Where are we going? I'm not going to tell you. Well, I'll wait. No, 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 go. It was in the going that he ended up. How did Abraham end up in the promised land? God never told him, go this direction, go that direction. He just said, go, and you're going to end up in the land that I promised you. Well, Abraham had responsibilities. His responsibilities were a lot of flocks. (laughs) Well, where's their grass? If you follow Abraham's from Ur all the way through Haran, all the way down into Canaan, he followed the fertile crescent. He just followed the grass where there was pasture land, and he just kept on moving as long as there was open doors. And one day, he, he's doing what he normally did, and God said, hey, by the way, look around. Yeah, you're there. It's all yours. This is the land that I promised you. How, how did we get here? Sometimes he tells you all the details, and sometimes those prayers that don't seem to be answered are actually the reason why you had the opportunities that you had. And and the thing is not trusting our understanding, but trusting our God. Not trusting our ability to figure things out, but trusting that he's going to make it work. So, if we know... I mean, there's some things that we do know, right? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Wait a second, that's unjust. Justice is right. (laughs) What does justice look like? That's another question. He's gonna have to detail that. But there's some clear things. Wait a second, this is sickness. In heaven, there's no sickness. I'm gonna pray for healing. I know that's God's will, right? There's certain things that are pretty clear but it's not the details that he makes clear. And it's not the how all the time. Sometimes he does. So we don't put our trust in that he'll never make it clear. We don't put our trust that we can't do anything until it's completely made clear. We just put our trust in him, not in this. It's a big thing. It's, it's coming back to that first thing we talked about, the great work of discipleship when it comes to prayer is instead of trying to figure out what to do, invite him in we usually exhaust all of our ideas and then we turn to prayer but it's turning to prayer first ask him to do it if it's not God's will ask him to stop it your kingdom come your will be done now there's some things that we don't have responsibility over we still pray for those things Right, that's another aspect of like the things that we're responsible for. If we're responsible for a business and we pray for our business, that is intercession. Responsible for, for our family, we pray for our family, that is intercession. But I, I'm not really responsible for, I'll, I'll use an example, Israel, but I still pray for Israel. It's, it's not my responsibility. I can't do anything. Not really. But I can pray, which actually is doing something a lot more than what the activity of the strength of hands can accomplish. So any place that our heart moves and we see something wrong, we use the parable of Jesus. Who's your neighbor? Remember the Good Samaritan? It's the need that you see. That's what you pray for. If you see it, You notice it, pray for it. How do you intercede? Well, it's not about having the right words. People with eloquent prayer language do not get more answered prayers than people with (laughs) uneloquent prayer language. You, you, You just talk to them like you talk to a friend. Daddy, this ain't right. What are you doing? When are you going to do something about this? But he's not afraid of us being honest. Actually, one of the principles, and we 
get a chance, we'll, we'll do some, a lot more teaching on prayer. Um, but one of the principles that's key is dishonest prayers aren't heard from heaven. If it's not true in your heart and it's coming out of your mouth, there's no substance that actually makes it into the spiritual realm and accomplishes something. It's the integrity. It's the cry of the heart. And sometimes that cry of the heart doesn't even need words. It just comes out in groans. And sometimes that's our spirit interceding in us and sometimes that's his spirit interceding in us and they're both really good. And he hears and he responds. It's not about having the right words. If it's having the right words, then we've got our spell book. If you say it this way, in this atmosphere, and you say it with this cadence, then God hears. That's a spell. It's not how it works. He's a friend. You just ask. And sometimes you realize you, you've already talked to him about it and you know what is supposed to happen and you don't have to ask. You just tell it to happen because you've already had the conversation and already understand it. Having the right heart is the key, not having the right words. 1 John 5.14 gives us this principle. And this is the confidence that we have toward him that if we ask anything according to his will he hears us verse 15 and if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask we know that we have the request that we've asked of him you know there, there's it's interesting when you go through scripture there's five or six different things that the bible tells you that are keys as to whether your prayer actually gets heard or not heard. Not every prayer prayed gets heard. Now, not that he doesn't hear the words, but he doesn't hear. He doesn't pay attention. One of them is according to his will. If we're praying outside of his will, he's not hearing it. And sometimes... It's a rabbit, but I can finish this one really quick. <laughs> Sometimes it's how we get into what we call charismatic witchcraft. By using our will and trying to use our spiritual abilities to cause it to happen instead of surrendering to his will. But it, you can actually recognize that if you have a relationship with the Lord where your heart is still sensitive to him. You haven't closed it off because he didn't do what you wanted him to. If your heart is still open to him, you, you'll actually feel his check. You'll actually feel that and you'll have to ignore him saying no for you to continue praying in that way. So just keep your heart sensitive. Just, just keep it about relationship because that, that's the whole thing. It's, it's not about accomplishing stuff. It's about relationship. The, the whole thing of intercession is that we, we've got a friend that can do all kinds of stuff and we get to talk to him and ask him to do it. And then when he does it, he turns around and says, wow, look at what you did. I'm like, I didn't do anything. Said, but you cared and that was enough. Amen. And that caught my heart and that's why it happened. So you get rewards because you prayed for the thing that I wanted to happen. And at the end of the, this thing, when we stand before this great white throne judgment, some of our rewards will be for the prayers that we prayed. So, an intercessor. Somebody to ask God to do something for somebody else. That's all of us. If you have relationship with God, you're called to be an intercessor. Whatever the role that you play in life, and the more responsibility that comes with that role, the greater the call for intercession. And if you 
Stop asking him to get involved with what you're responsible for, what he put into your hands for you to do. That actually is a sin against the Lord. We're all intercessors. Let that invitation be an encouragement. It's not a wait, now I have something else I have to do. No, it actually takes a weight off. I mean, the thing that I have to do, I don't have to do it alone. Amen. And isn't that his promise? Emmanuel, God with us. He comes alongside. So Father, we, sometimes it feels like David, like what, what you've said and what you promised is too good to be true. And how would you even think about people? And yet you've chosen to put your attention and your affection on us. Lord, and you, you didn't just call us like ants in a colony just to obey mindless promptings. You've called us as friends. You've invited us into your counsel that you would share with us everything that the Father has shared with you, Jesus, this is astounding. You, you would give us a part to play in what you're doing in the world, that, that we actually have something that's going to make a difference, that, that the, the weakness of our words shifts nations and spiritual powers that we can't comprehend because we've asked for your will to come into situations because we let our hearts be moved by things that we saw that were not right. Oh God, teach us how to pray. Lord, we, we, we come like the disciples. They'd been hanging out for a year, two years, they're like we 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 don't we don't know how to pray. Like teach us how to, how do you how do you pray? Teach us how to pray, Lord. We we want to know how to pray. We want to be a people of prayer. We want to be a people of presence. We want to be a people that are marked by your name. We we want to have a part to play in your kingdom coming. Your purposes being accomplished in in our families in in our in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods, in our communities, in our nations. Lord, we, we want to see heaven invade the earth. Lord, we recognize the, the invitation. And it's, at least a, a couple of you just feel like this is it's almost like too, too heavy or it's too much or it's, it's like this thing of it, it's just beyond reach. It's almost a sense of unworthiness and I, I keep on coming back to that uh, Isaiah when he stood before the throne and his first thought, oh God, <laughs> I'm, an, I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. I'm qualified because of what I've done and who I am. And God's immediate response was cleansing. I don't know if it's, it's something specific. If there's something specific that you, you feel has disqualified you, just it, it's very easy to ask the Lord to come. Just repent, Lord, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. His promise is if we confess our sins, he is faithful. He is faithful to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you've confessed 
and you don't feel that freedom, that is a lie. Rebuke it. Don't hold on to that. That's not yours. That's the enemy. It's the accuser. Do not listen to that voice. But I knew better and I still messed up. Yeah, yeah. If we confess our sins, he is faithful. He is faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse. So that voice of shame and accusation is muzzled now. There's a couple that because of your experiences with your father not wanting to spend time with you, not trusting you, telling you how you've, you did it wrong or just not seeing your value. You've held back from coming to the Father with confidence. And it, 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 so one or two of you, you've already done this, but if you haven't already, just forgive your dad for not representing the Father perfectly. There's only one perfect one, and he's in heaven. And ask him to come and to father you. Lord, I want to know what it's like to be loved by my father, by you, Father. Now, Holy Spirit, I'm asking you would come into that place of their hearts and cry out within them, Abba, Daddy. Cry out within them, Abba, Daddy. Draw near, especially for those that had a critical, demanding father and they couldn't do well enough Lord, we just speak over them. This is my beloved son. This is my beloved daughter. They make me happy. They make me happy. Come. It's the father's good pleasure. It makes the father happy. It gives him joy to give you the kingdom. No more fear. No more fear. Draw near. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Come, Lord. Come. Father, let those that have not already recognized it, let them experience your invitation to the secret place, to the place of prayer. Lord, those that have had another season where it was there and then they've just gotten busy and distracted and Lord, draw them back. I'm asking that you would open up a door of grace right now for people to respond to your invitation to pray and intercede and find a measure of grace that's not always available. I'm asking that it would be opened now. Grace to pray. Hunger Hunger, hunger, hunger for his presence being released. Hunger being released. Hunger being released. Jesus.
Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Lord, where the enemy has been mocking simple words from a simple heart, Lord, would you silence that voice and let your little girls and your sons know how affectionate you are to hear their little voice. Jesus. Lord, would you make us a people of prayer? Would you mark this house with prayer and intercession? Would you make us a people of prayer? Lord, we see need around us in our children, in our families, in our extended families, in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods. We see need. Your kingdom needs to come. We need your kingdom. God, would you come? Would you come? Lord, would you help us to realize how powerful prayer is? Lord, would you forgive us for discounting this powerful weapon that you have given us push back the enemy in our sphere we choose to stand we choose to not back down any further we will stand we will not be silenced Father, I thank you for a spirit of faith that's being released right now. Just increase that spirit of faith being released right now. Come. Thank you, God. Increase. Thank you, Papa. Thank you. Wow, wow, wow. Well, let's practice. Anybody has something that they need prayer for, just stand up where you're at and somebody's going to come and intercede and ask God to help you with what you need. It could be anything. Yeah, we're going to go ahead and end the live stream now.